So, um, uh, so I, so you guys were gonna. So I got to ask, like, where are the PDEs and all this, and like, where is the Fourier analysis? Okay. So if you can see, the next couple objectives are um, uh, are, are going to be related to the, these things called sturm louville problems, or Louvi problems, and um, I, I kind of want to motivate why we're doing this first, and. To do that, I, I want to talk about the vibrating string problem and in, in this thing called separation of variables. Before I get into that, um, I'm going to state that there's going to be a quiz um, on how to solve an ODE, so to next class. A linear uh, ODE next class. Um, Another thing that I want you guys to do is uh, I want you guys to try at, at home. There's an there's a objective that says, I understand what a partial differential equation is. And I think you guys uh, know what a partial differential equation is from, uh, from Math 121. But I want you to try those exercises and then come back. Um, so, so try the, uh, this, uh, there's this objective that says, um, for understanding a partial differential equation is. It's a review topic. OK, so I want you guys to, it's, it's like it'll give you some PDEs, and it'll, it'll give you a solution, and it'll ask you to plug it in and just verify, right? I just want to see that you guys can do that. And then I'll come back next class and see how you did on this. Um, OK? And then uh, if you guys had any trouble with that, let me know. And then after that, we'll, we'll do a quiz on that. There'll be some, some points. OK? Um, OK, so today's objectives um, um, so, uh, I want you guys to understand what eigenfunctions are. So, and where they come from, um, uh, and eigenfunctions uh, coming from boundary value problems. So you can try the problems associated with this. Um, and, uh, it, and so there's also, the, uh, there's also these boundary value problem ODEs. So there's, a, there's two sets of topics, OK? So um, all right. So uh, I want to get to these things. But first, I, I want to motivate them with an example. Okay, and the example is uh, the vibrating string problem. Okay. All right, so I'm going to set up uh, this differential equation. So this is the one where, like, if you pluck a guitar, and you're going to describe the motion of the string. Uh, after you pluck the guitar. All right, so um, the, the partial differential equation, so, so we're going to have u. It's a function of x and t. And x is going to be in some interval of bounded length here. So what we're going to have is we're going to have like uh, some length here. Length, we're going to have 0. And, uh, and then there's going to be some string. Right, and it's going to be fixed here and fixed here, and it's going to be moving up and down, right? According to uh, uh, a certain differential equation, okay? So it's a vibrating string, okay? So this is so it'll have some x position, and then it'll it'll change over time. So it's like a movie, okay? So every time you'll get a function. All right, um, and so the differential equation is described as follows. Okay, I'm not going to derive where this comes from. So then there's this uh, okay, 
so there's boundary conditions and then there's initial conditions. All right. Um, so let me just say uh, this, this goes for t greater than or equal to 0 and x in this interval. The boundary conditions are as follows. So one endpoint is going to be fixed here. So this is it's going to be fixed at 0. And the initial endpoint is also going to be fixed. So for every time, it's going to stay fixed. And then we're going to specify some initial conditions. So we're going to say that uh, at, t uh, at, uh, at time 0, there's going to be some function. So this is going to be some given initial uh, value. So it's going to be some sort of initial displacement. And, um, uh, and then we're going to say that uh, its, its x derivative is going to be 0. In, at the initial time here. And so this is for t greater than or equal to 0, these conditions here. And this is for x in this interval, like so. OK, so this is the uh, uh, initial boundary value problem for, for a vibrating string. The velocity, for those who are interested in the physics of it, so, uh, so by the way, so this velocity right, is given by uh, tension, T is just the tension of the cord, so T is tension, and mu is this linear density. So it's just the mass divided by the length. So you'll have a, a certain mass of a string, right, like a guitar string, and then you'll uh, take the mass of it and divide it by the length, and this is, uh, this, is this thing here, okay? All right, and you can derive that. And so this, by the way, this holds for uh, the equation uh, works for small slopes because it uses some approximations to derive it. All right, so like, so like if you think about it, the string is way longer, right, on a guitar than it is when you pluck it, okay? So like... It, the displacement is small compared to uh, the, the overall length of the string. Okay, so um, so an example of an initial function that we could be interested in would be um, like this one. So so here's the length, and then we could say at half the length. Um, we could displace to a height h. Okay, and so this could be uh, u0 of x. This is this function here. So this is the x-axis. And then you could try and explicitly describe this thing. So I'm just going to describe it as a, a piecewise thing. So, um, so it's going to have slope uh, h divided by l over 2 for, for half the length for uh, 0 to L over 2. And then we could say it's the opposite. So um, it'll be H minus, and then we're going to do uh, the, the, the exact opposite of this thing. It'll, it'll be decreasing, uh, and we'll have to displace it like that. So X an element of L over 2 to L. Okay? So we'll have uh, uh, this function here. So we can look at what this thing is, all right? So I want to talk about this differential equation and how to solve it, all right? So for simplicity today, I'm going to choose some special values of this thing. Um, you can actually change variables from the differential equation that I'm going to write down to that differential equation that I just wrote down. So like, there's this one with the L's and the H's and the V's and everything, right? But I'm going to uh, assume that uh, I, uh, things are one, okay? So, and I'll talk about what we can and can't change in, uh, in the future, but uh, for simplicity, right, uh, let's take, and since we're just going to talk about the math, V is equal to one, L is equal to one, H is equal to one, okay? So, um, in, in this particular case, we get the following uh, partial differential equation. So UTT is equal to UXX, 
right? That's the uh, that's the, uh, the the regular PDE. So t is greater than or equal to zero. X is in in the interval zero to one. Okay, we're going to have uh, the boundary values. So u of um, so I did x first, right? So uh, one t. Or say u u of zero t is equal to u of one t. And this is going to be 0. Uh, this is for all time, right? And um, we're going to have the, the initial condition. So um, u of x, 0, we'll say that this is u of uh, 0 bar. This can really be anything, but I'm just going to use uh, the same function here, OK, for 0 to 1. and um, x zero and this is going to be zero, okay? So we have uh, so these are the initial conditions, and this thing here is the um, uh, the boundary condition. Okay, you could put other conditions as well. Okay, so this is something that we could ask to do. All right. Um, so uh, in particular, when we when we replace everything here, so let's look at what this thing becomes. So u0 bar x, OK, so for this particular thing, this will be 2x, 0 to 1 half. And I think we have um, 2 minus 2x minus 1 half, something like this, for x, an element of 1 half to 1. OK? All right. And so this thing is just equal to 2 minus 2x, I guess. Or let's see, um, 1 minus, well, yeah, 2 minus 2x. And that, I guess, that's OK, because we started at x is equal to a half. So this is actually just 2 minus 2x. OK, so maybe we'll use that in the future. We're not going to get to this part right now. So it's not so important. Um, but uh, what I want to talk about is a solution for solving uh, these things. And the, the, the method for solving these things is a thing called separation of variables. All right, so let's talk about this separation of variables. And so we're going to do a trick. All right, so the trick is to look for a particular type of solution. So the trick is look for solutions of the form u of xt is xx tt. Okay? So there's going to be a function of one variable in x and a function of one variable in t, and we multiply them together. Okay? So let's put this into our equation. Into the equation here. This equation gives the following. So when we take a derivative in x, we're only going to get this part here, derivative in this thing. So it gives x prime prime of x, t of t, and then we're going to have x of x, t prime prime of t, like so. OK? This is a really cool trick, right? So now when I do this, uh, look that you can separate the x's from, it's, it's called separation because I can separate the x's and the t's, right? So this tells us that x prime prime of x over x of x is equal to t prime prime over t, t of t. Right, so I divided both sides by t and I divided both sides by x. OK? So notice that this thing, this only depends on, 
on x, on little x. And this side here, this only depends on little t. OK? So, so like if I were to take the partial derivative with respect to x of this thing, what would I get? 0, right? So the derivative of this thing with respect to x is 0. The derivative of this thing with respect to t is 0, right? So this tells us that x prime prime uh, of x over x of x is equal to t prime prime over t. This is equal to lambda, and this is just some constant. OK? So we have these two things, and this, this allows us to break up our partial differential equation into two ordinary differential equations. So this breaks up the partial differential equation into two ordinary differential equations. All right, and so what are the two ordinary differential equations that we have? So the two ODEs are as follows. We have x prime prime of x is equal to lambda x of x. And t prime prime of t is equal to lambda t of t. OK? So, um, OK, so these are the two ODEs that we'll consider. And so we'll note that x of x uh, is an eigenfunction for the operator dx squared with eigenvalue lambda. So it's an eigenfunction. So it's an eigenvector, right? Eigenvectors, it doesn't matter what we, we talked about vector spaces, right? It doesn't matter that it's like a finite dimensional vector space. We could have infinite dimensional vector spaces or these, these function spaces. All that matters is that they're closed under addition and scalar multiplication, okay? And so you have this derivative and it acts on this and it's, uh, uh, it, it spits out lambda times our original thing. Also, this thing is an eigenfunction uh, for, for this operator with eigenvalue lambda. OK, so one of the questions we want to answer is like, OK, so all right, so we have these things. And then we have like these extra conditions that we impose, right? We have like this condition, this boundary condition, and then we have these initial values, right? So what we could do now is, it, so we took this form of the solution, right? We plugged it into this part, right? And now we want to use the other pieces of information to, um, to, to do something, right? We want to use the other pieces of information to, um, to, to solve uh, the differential equation, okay? So like, uh, what we could do is we could, we could take this thing and plug this into the boundary condition, or we could plug it into the initial values. You could have something here like ut, or you could have other, other combinations of things here. So ut is equal to something, right? So it turns out the beneficial, the, the thing that you want to do is, is to look at the boundary values first, because so, that'll, that'll rule out some of the lambdas that you have. And it's kind of like magical that this works, okay? It's just like a thing. You can try doing both. Uh, I'm going to show you that you want to look at the boundary values, and the boundary values will actually reduce uh, what possible lambdas you need to consider. Okay, so let's look at the boundary values. Okay, so we separated it into two ordinary differential equations. And now what I want to do is I want to derive some conditions on x and t coming from the boundary values and the initial values. Okay? Any questions so far about what I did? It's pretty straightforward. You just, you guess this, you plug it in, and, and uh, it turns out that uh, 
uh, you get these differential equations. Okay? So let's look at the boundary values. Okay, so the boundary conditions were the following. So is u1 t is equal to 0, and u0 t is equal to 0. Okay, and, and these give the following conditions. So u, again, u of x t is x of x and t of t. So let's put them in. So we have uh, x of 1, t of t is equal to 0, and then we have x of 0, t of t is equal to 0. Okay, so assuming uh, t of t is not equal to 0, which would just mean that we're looking at the 0 solution here, right, um, we get the following conditions x of 1 is equal to 0, and x of 0 is equal to 0. Okay? And, um, and the initial values will give you something else. Okay? So the initial values, so let me remark. So the initial values okay, so um, so if we did something like uh, u of 0, 1 is equal to u0 bar of x, okay? So let's see what each of these types of conditions give, okay? So we'll, we'll do something like, uh, so what did we do? Uh, initial value, so, so we're doing, sorry, u of uh, x0. Initial time. Time is zero, right? right? So this is equal to, I don't know, you could do something like f of x. This could be like g of x. Okay? So this thing gives you, what do each of these things give you? Um, so this one gives you that uh, u of, or sorry, x of x, t of zero is equal to u bar zero x. So this is kind of, okay, so I'll, we'll come back to this, okay? Uh, x prime of x, t of 0 is f of x, or we could have something like uh, x of x, t prime of 0 is equal to g of x. Okay, so we'll get these conditions here. Uh, these are not going to make sense immediately, okay? And we're going to have to make sense of them. Um, but we, we can write out what they mean, okay? And so we can think about them, and this is what people did, all right? Okay, so uh, let's focus now on this condition plus the, the ordinary differential equation for x, okay? So in x, from all our conditions, we can see that we get a boundary value problem in x. So, so, for, so focusing on j just x, we see we get a boundary value ODE. Okay, so what does this mean? So this means this set of equations here. X prime prime X is equal to lambda X of X. So we have that eigenfunction thing. X of zero is equal to zero and X of one is also equal to zero plus some other stuff, okay, that we're going to ignore for the moment. All right, so we have this thing, and now we're back to studying ordinary differential equations again, okay? So we have to uh, go back and study ordinary differential equations. All right, so let's try and solve this thing, okay? Let's solve this boundary value problem. So what that means is that we're going to write down a general solution. We don't know what lambda is right now. Lambda could be anything. Right? And we're going to try and figure out what lambda can be. It turns out that this is kind of like a magical fact, and it's not obvious from if you didn't know it. But by specifying those conditions at the boundary, it eliminates, it's, it tells you what lambda can be. All right? Um, okay, so uh, let's do the solution of the boundary value of the... So 
So I wanted to do, so at the beginning of this, I, I debated whether I should just like do this, right? And introduce that to you guys or get it from the, the, the string problem. But I think it's a little bit more motivating to see why, like, why we want to study this type of problem. Okay. So uh, here, so if we let, let's say x of x be e to the mx, right, we get the following. We get that, uh, uh, well, we get m squared e to the mx is equal to lambda e to the mx, which tells us that m squared is equal to lambda. All right. And so this tells us that m is equal to the plus or minus the square root of lambda. Okay, so lambda is just some constant that we don't know. All right. So, uh, so let's put this back in. So this means, this means the general solution. So the general solution of this thing, x prime prime is equal to lambda x is the following, it's that x of x is equal to c1 e, then we have square root of lambda x plus c2, so sorry if that looks like an e, c2 e to the minus square root of lambda x. So that's what the general solution looks like. So these are called the boundary values because uh, they're the values on the boundary of the interval. So we have this interval 0, 1, right? And they're the values here, OK? And, um, uh, and so let's uh, plug in the boundary values. So using the boundary values, So we get the following, right? We get that x of 0, and we have a condition on x of 1. This was 0, this was 1. You can see that like, you can replace things here and, and get some other conditions, right? But we'll get that this is equal to c1 plus c2. And this one is c1 e to the square root of lambda plus c2 e to the minus square root of lambda. So these were the boundary conditions. OK, so let's solve for, uh, let's say, C1 and C2. Well, um, well, we're going to be able to solve for one of them, right? So let's see. So, this, so the first equation tells us that C1 is equal to minus C2. OK, so let's put into the second equation. OK, and what do we get? So we get that c1, 0, is equal to c1, e to the square root of lambda, minus c1, e to the minus square root of lambda, here, uh, like this. OK, and so this tells us that c1, so we have e to the square root of lambda, minus e to the minus square root of lambda, and this thing here. OK, so we have this thing's equal to 0. So if c1 is equal to 0, so note that if c1 is equal to 0, then c, this implies then c2 is equal to 0, and x is equal to 0. OK, so we get nothing really interesting. OK, so if c2 is not equal to 0, or c1 is not equal to 0, then what do we have? So we have 0 is equal to c1 e to the square root of lambda minus e to the minus square root of lambda. OK, so this tells us that 0 is equal to e to the square root of lambda minus e to the minus square root of lambda. OK, let's put it, bring it to the other side. So this is equal to e to the minus square root of lambda e to the square root of lambda. OK, I can multiply both sides by e to the square root of lambda. So this tells us that 1 is equal to e to the 2 square root of lambda. All right. 
way to the SIP here. Okay. Do we know solutions of this equation? Right, so here we have 1 is equal to e to the blah. e to the blah, when is that equal to 1? Yeah, 2 pi i, right? 2 pi i or 2 pi n, n i, right? So this tells us that, that this thing, 2 square root of lambda, is equal to 2 pi i times some integer n. n is an integer. Do you guys agree? All right. Uh, all right, so we can cancel the twos, right? And so this tells us that square root of lambda is equal to pi i times n, for n an integer. OK, and this tells us that lambda, square root of lambda, is equal to, sorry, that lambda here, so we'll square both sides, and this is equal to negative n squared pi squared. And this is for n is equal to 0, 1, 2, etc. OK, so this, root, this tells us what our eigenvalues can be. OK, so lambda n are, is equal to minus n squared pi squared for n is equal to 0, 1, 2, etc. OK, um, I just want to bring up a point about uh, the n is equal to 0 case. OK, for this particular problem. Right. OK, so I've been sweeping something under the rug. In the case n is equal to 0 or lambda is equal to 0, what happens? So the ODE here, this thing here, so what does this become? So this becomes x prime prime is equal to 0, right? OK, and so when x prime prime is equal to 0, what are the solutions of that equation? So they're just linear things, right? So the solutions are of the form x of x is equal to c1 plus c2x. OK? And if we check the boundary conditions here, boundary conditions, so we have that x of 1 is equal to 0 and x of 0 is equal to 0. And this tells us that oh, x of 0, so this is equal to c1, this is 0. And x of 1, so now this is c1 plus c2. This was 0 from the previous thing. And that tells us c2 is equal to 0. So x of x is equal to 0. And we get the 0 solution. Zero solution when lambda is equal to 0, or equivalently when n is equal to 0. OK? Uh, where? C2x. In here? So C2 times 1 is C2, which is 0. Ah, so yeah. So that was when, so that was when lambda was non-zero, right? So implicitly when I was doing everything, I was saying that lambda, I was treating lambda like it wasn't zero. So I snuck that by you. Sneaky. Right? I cheated. OK. So um, here, uh, yeah, I just, I just wanted to look at the special case. So I, I didn't want to talk about lambda is equal to 0 first, because I thought it was more important just to like, give you like a general statement. Right? But technically, we've got to be careful about that stuff. OK, so, um, uh, so now what? OK, so now. Uh, so now we have uh, uh, we have this 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 guy here, 
Okay, so let's look at what the solution looks like in the particular case uh, for xn. So now we have these lambda n's and we have these xn's. Okay. Let me say what they are. Okay. So, um, so now for lambda n is equal to minus n squared pi squared. For n in the natural numbers, the natural numbers will be 1, 2, 3, etc. Okay? What do we get? So we have that uh, we have that x prime prime is equal to minus n squared pi squared uh, x. Okay? And we had that um, uh, we solved and we got the following uh, that uh, x was equal to, uh, and so we had c1, we pulled out an overall constant c1, and then we had e to the square root of this, so we had i n pi x, uh, and then we had a minus e to the minus i n pi x. So that was the square root of lambda, plus and minus the square root of lambda. Okay? Okay, and now you guys might be able to recognize this. So this is C1 times, and what is that thing? So from Euler's, these Euler formula identities. So cosine is when you add the complex conjugate, because it, that'll put a negative on the imaginary part, right? So let's do this again e to the i theta minus e to the minus i theta. Okay, so this is cosine of theta plus i sine theta. And this is equal to plus cosine, or this is a minus cosine theta minus i sine theta. Do you guys agree? So what's this one? 2i sine theta. Okay, so this will be 2i sine theta. Or sine, sorry, not, what am I doing? 2i, and then we do this, n pi x. Okay, so this is scratch. Okay, so there's an overall constant here, and so um, I'm just going to normalize this so, so this is nice, okay? So I'm just going to make it so that this thing is just, okay, so letting, so it's, you know, this thing's unique up to a constant, right? It's one of these eigenvectors. It's unique up to a constant. And so I'm going to let C1 be 1 over 2i so that uh, xn of x is this sine of pi n x, okay? So, um, so the, let, let me just kind of recap what happened. So to recap, so, um, so for, the, for the boundary value ODE, uh, this thing, x prime prime is equal to lambda x, and uh, x of 1 is equal to x of 0 is equal to 0, um, we found that lambda n so we found solutions and the solutions were uh, lambda n here had to be minus n pi squared, and xn had to be equal to, uh, well, up to a multiple, uh, n pi x. Okay? And so this is the eigen, these are, these are the eigenvalues for the boundary value problem, and these are the eigenfunctions for the value, boundary value problem.
okay? And you'll notice that, that these, these are kind of, uh, this breaks this problem of like, so let me, let me kind of draw a picture here. So these are the various uh, harmonics sometimes. So these will be like, so we'll have something like this. Here's zero, one. And we'll have something like this, right? And then I need to do three, uh, right, like this. And, right, and then we'll do something like, we'll have four of them. Okay, so these are the pictures for the various ends of these functions. Uh, this is n is equal to 2, this is n is equal to 3, n is equal to 4. And notice they satisfy these boundary values like so. Okay, so hopefully I, I drew these correctly. Um, I think I did. Right? Okay. So, um, and so what we're actually going to do, the trick now is that we're going to, so I told you, so we had those initial conditions that we didn't really know how to deal with, right? Um, and uh, notice that if I like take two of these solutions and I add them together up to a multiple, right, I get another solution of the, the boundary value problem, right? Well, with the, the sum of the lambda, well, not quite the sum of the lambdas, but, um, well, not quite that. So, okay, let me just kind of tell you what we're going to do is we're going to try and, like, use these functions, right, to, to write other functions as linear combinations of these functions. So we're going to decompose them into the, these different parts, okay? And, and um, so we're going to expand functions in terms of these, these eigenvectors or these eigenfunctions, okay? Okay, so the idea again, so in the, the general strategy, uh, and we go to, oh, what time do we go to? 40? Yeah, okay. So the general strategy, so now let me tell you what the general strategy is. Okay. Uh, the... Okay, so here's what we're going to do, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to solve, so we, we try and write, xn as a basis for our functions. All right, so in particular, we'll write u of xt will be a sum from n is equal to 1 up to infinity of cn, xn of x, tn of t, okay? Uh, where these things, where xn of t, so where cn are some constants, we need to solve for And xn, xn of x are our eigenfunctions. And these tn of t solve the ODE. we get from separation. Of variables. So here you have all these different like the harmonics here and you're going to break them into these different uh, uh, levels here. So we're going to break it into a bunch of different levels and then we're going to make them time dependent and put them as a, a combination of these different uh, uh, frequency things. Okay, that's the idea.
Okay, so this is how we're going to do this. And um, so let's like look at our our uh, let's say let's look at our initial condition, right? So have something like this. Right? And then we have some other conditions. Okay, so the general solution for this thing is um, here. So I think we have TNT looks like alpha of n cosine pi n t plus beta n sine pi n t. Okay? So this is what these things look for. We need to solve for, th for those things as well. Okay? Um, okay, so it's like we have the, um, so, so let's, let's look at like what happens for the initial conditions. Okay? So for the initial condition, So one trick, so like for the initial condition. Uh, so we have something like u of x t is equal, or u of x zero was this thing, right? We had this uh, function here. Okay, so the trick now is to do the following trick is to write u0 of x is a sum, and I don't want to use the same letters, but let's do, that, have I used a n yet? a n, x n of x. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and expand it. And so just like we expanded things in terms of like Taylor series, we're going to use these functions, and we're going to expand these things in terms of these functions. OK? So we need to solve for these coefficients, so we need to expand these, okay? And then what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to try and equate uh, these things. So then what we're going to get is we're going to get, uh, so let's try this thing. So then we have, let's see what you, this, this equation becomes. This, this equation here. This equation becomes, uh, so, uh, so we have a sum, n is equal to 1 up to infinity. So I'm going to take that, that thing there, cn, and then we have xn of x, tn of 0 is equal to, uh, and then we're going to have a sum like this, n is equal to 1 up to infinity. Hopefully I started at 1 at all these. 1 up to infinity of a n xn of x, okay? And so maybe here, like if this was like, if these were vectors, if these were linearly independent vectors in a finite dimensional vector space, we could just like equate the coefficients, right? Right? So maybe that's what we can do. So maybe we can just try, so for equations like these, we'll just try and equate the coefficients. But I'm, I'm going to try and have to justify this, right? So. Uh, x and of x is like basis vectors. And just equate the coefficients. And in this case, what do we get? So we'll get cn tn0 here is equal to a n, something like this. And this is something we solve for. OK? So um, all right. So I'm going to leave it at this. right? So this is kind of the idea, right? Um, but what we're going to need to do is we're going to see if, if uh, so what I'll have to do is I'm going to have to sort out the linear algebra of this, OK? So like, 
When can we equate a coefficients? How do we solve for the coefficients? What functions are we allowed to sp expand like this? Like when is it that we're cheating? When is it that we're not cheating? Can we do this? You know, this is only for the string equation. Can we do this for all PDEs, right? Like, does this work all the time? And so uh, a large part of, like, math in the 1800s was devoted to figuring, and I guess even, you know, uh, in the 1900s, it was devoted to figuring out when it was possible to do this type of thing. Okay, so it gets into some serious, serious math, right, serious analysis as to when, you, when and when you're not allowed to do this and what type of functions you need to assume, what type of things you need to assume about this function, like does it need to be more than continuous, things like this, okay? So that's, how, that's where the analysis part comes in to all this stuff. Okay, so uh, we're gonna start doing that next time, okay? And I'm gonna start talking about that type of stuff. And then we'll go back to solving this particular equation, and then we're gonna do some more equations after that. All right.